Welcome back to the titration lecture. Uh, in this lecture, we are now going to look more specifically into acid-base titration. Uh, acid-base titration is a very classical example of titration reactions. Uh, they are very widely used today in food analysis, for example. Already was mentioned the example of determining total acidity of wine samples but also in other kinds of total acidity determinations in the food uh, matrices. But it's also widely used for standardization in the chemical in industry and many, many other applications. Uh, Acid-based titration, we will here look in more detail and provide with this a kind of a background to titration and important factors in titrations in general. Uh, so, Titration reactions are so widely used because they are very uh, fast, they have a very clear stoichiometry, as well as they proceed to the end. And not least, uh, and not less important is the fact that uh, the endpoint visualization with various different indicators is accessible, as there are very many different indicators for very many different uh, endpoints as well as uh, different environments that could, can be used in the titration. So let's dig into the, into the topic of acid-based titration. And when we say acid-based titration here, then we mean constant acidity or basicity. This means that by acids we consider compounds that are dissociating in the solutions so that they give up a proton while bases are compounds that gain a proton. So, of course, most simple acids could be a hydrochloric acid or a formic acid, acetic acid, something like this. And as bases, we consider then compounds like sodium hydroxide, where the actual basicity comes from the hydroxyl groups, or ammonia, where ammonia itself can uh, gain a proton in the acid-base reactions. And uh, important um, factors are also that there are, is an acid that we consider as well as a base, and during an acid-base reaction, a conjugated base marked with an A and a minus charge in this uh, reaction scheme is formed as well as a conjugated acid of the base, so HB+. So these are also important um, definitions in the context of acid-based titration. Uh, one important reminder from basic chemistry course is the acidic acid strength. So by acid strength, we consider how much, to what degree, the uh, acid in the solution is dissociating into the corresponding proton and anion. And this acid strength is described by the dissociation constant Ka of the corresponding acid. And it is defined as the uh, multiplication of the protons formed from in this dissociation reaction uh, and the anions formed, so their activities actually, divided by the activity of the uh, of the neutral acid form. And in the diluted solutions, we can assume that the activities are very close to the concentrations of these species, and we can substitute it just with the uh, actual equilibrium concentrations of the protons, ions, and neutral acid forms. And uh, usually we don't use just Ka, but we operate with a minus logarithm of this dissociation constant, so a pKa. And this is a very common way of describing the acidic properties, which is also uh, intuitively re can be related to uh, acid strengths. So compounds which have a lower pKa values are stronger acid, and compounds which have higher pKa values are weaker acids. And if we are talking about the pKa's of bases, then we don't mean, of course, that the bases would become 
bit would act as acids, but then the pKa's correspond to the conjugated acids of the bases. So when we go back to this previous reaction, then if we uh, express a pK, uh, uh, pKa for actually basic compounds, so for example ammonia, then we are considering that for the conjugated acid. So in case of ammonia, that would be for the ammonium cation, uh, we are expressing this uh, pKa value. Uh, very strong acids, so the ones for which pK values are negative, we consider as being fully dissociated in the uh, solution. So this means that there is no neutral form for these compounds present in the solution. They are fully dissociated. Only proton form from these compounds and anions of, of these compounds present. Uh, so which kind of compounds are these that we can then titrate with the acid base titration and determine the concentrations? Of course, uh, into this category is four different acids, um, which can then be titrated with a basic titrate, uh, titrant. And one of the most common groups is mineral acids. So these, these are examples of all sorts of standardization of mineral acid solutions, for example. And mineral acids, you very often have pK values which are very low, and they can therefore be very, very easily titrated. Also, however, we can titrate different carboxylic acids. So uh, formic acid, acetic acid. One of the examples is the uh, determination of the concentration of, of acetic acid in vinegar. Um, they usually have pK values between 2 and 5 for majority of the carboxylic acids. And they can also be very nicely determined uh, in water solutions. Phenols are also acids, but their pKs are usually much higher, so they are much weaker uh, acids. Their pKs can be somewhere between 6 and 10, and um, usually the titration of phenols in water solutions is complicated, but they can be determined with titration reactions uh, in uh, other media, so or in organic solvents, for example. And protonated bases can also be titrated. Uh, and in addition to this, also basic compounds can, of course, be, um, can also be um, determined with uh, titration reactions. So the Bases, which are very strong bases, are the bases which have a pK value which is very high. And this can, these hey, bases can be easily titrated with an acidic titrant. And into the, this category fall, for example, all kinds of hydroxides, so sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, and so forth. Uh, but also, for example, some uh, organic hydroxides, or rather, yeah, uh, so anything that could give up a OH uh, during the dissociation in the solution. Uh, also into this category, four different amines. So amines, um, both primary, secondary, tertiary, they usually have a pK values which are slightly lower than the hydroxides do, but they are still su sufficiently good to be determined and uh, with the titration reactions um, in uh, water phase. And uh, these uh, amines, for example, determination of uh, amines for titration reaction is, for example, very important in uh, determining the total concentration of uh, proteins in different in various food products. So the um, proteins from the food products are first converted into um, ammonia, and then uh, they are the ammonia is titrated. Uh, also into this uh, category for all different heterocyclic 
ammonia, um, nitrogen compounds like pyridines or imidazoles, and they can also be determined with titration. However, because they are now weaker bases, they are usually determined not in water solution, but rather in organic media. For example, nicotine, which is also a heterocyclic uh, nitrogen compound, uh, can be titrated in organic solvents and uh, the nicotine concentration in tobacco, for example, can be determined. So, very various uh, different uh, titration reactions depending on what exactly is our aroma like can be performed. So let's now we, we look into more detail how does this titration actually look in practice and let's start with a very simple example of the titration of a strong acid for example hydrochloric acid with the strong base so sodium hydroxide. And let's take a case where the acid concentration, so the hydrochloric acid concentration is 0.01 moles per liter. And the we have 100 milliliters of such a solution and we titrate it with a um, um, sodium hydroxide solution with 0.1 moles per liter. So we don't, in this example, we don't have a, a, a real sample we rather have a standard solution and we are trying titrating this and we will just see what the what is happening in this titration usually these titrations are uh, described by a titration curve and this is very useful when we want to see which solutions which samples which compounds can be titrated with acid base titration which can't be and essentially this graph um, shows us what happens with the acidity of the solution when we are uh, adding the titrant, the sodium hydroxide, to the solution. And uh, here on the y-axis we have the acidity of the solution expressed as the pH of the solution. And pH, of course, is the minus logarithm of the activity of the protons in the solution and uh, for for diluted solutions we assume that this is sufficiently close to the minus logarithm of the protein concentration in the solution for strong acids like hydrochloric acid the ph of the solution is close enough to the minus logarithm of the concentration of this acid. And this is because we are, uh, for strong acids, they are fully dissociated uh, in the solution and their um, protein, the protein, protein concentration therefore equals the, the nominal concentration of the acid. So when no titrant has been added, the pH is just the minus logarithm of the hydrochloric acid concentration. And while uh, we start adding sodium hydroxide, so we move on this x-axis to a high to higher values, to more titrant added, then the hydrochloric acid concentration is decreasing because it's partially reacting with the sodium hydroxide. And therefore, slightly, 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 the pH of the solution is increasing. So the hydrochloric acid concentration is going down and the solution is becoming less and less acidic. Until the point where the sodium hydroxide moles that have been added to the solution equals the moles of the hydrochloric acid that were present in the original samples, sample that we took for titration. And in this point, the pH of the solution is 7. So this means a neutral solution where we have completely neutralized all of the hydrochloric acid with all of the sodium hydroxide. And after this point, the pH, if we continue adding sodium hydroxide to this solution, the pH is still equivalent to the minus logarithm of the protein concentration, 
But now, because the dominant species in this uh, solution is the sodium hydroxide, we can calculate the pH as 14 minus logarithm of the concentration of the sodium hydroxide that has been added uh, to the solution after the uh, so yeah so what is the sodium hydroxide nominal concentration in the full solution uh, this means that we also take into account what part of this has been neutralized by the hydrochloric acid that was originally present in the in the solution uh, so the important point, the stoichiometric point in this um, titration is this blue point here. So the point where hydrochloric acid has fully reacted with sodium hydroxide. So this is the point where the moles of the hydrochloric acid that were in the solution equal the moles of the sodium hydroxide that uh, have been added during titration. And during the titration, we want to find out this point. Determination of this point as accurately as possible is very, very important for us. And in, uh, in case of uh, acid-base titration, we increasingly use uh, indicators to, uh, to find out those points. And a very important part of this, as we will see later also, is the steepness of this titration curve. So how, how fast is the pH changing when we are approaching, when we are getting very close to the actual, uh, actual stoichiometric point? So this is very important and we'll see that during this lecture too. Now you might wonder what could be the effect of the concentration of the hydrochloric acid. Uh, in the previous video, I mentioned that uh, the concentration of the, uh, of the sample can't be too low and we can mostly determine, uh, we can mostly determine the main components in the solution. So let's see this effect based on the example of the hydrochloric acid titration with sodium hydroxide. So this is the same curve as we had before. The concentration was 0.01. Uh, molar solution of hydrochloric acid and the volume was 100 milliliters. And we keep the sodium hydroxide concentration the same throughout this example. So this is 0.1 mole per liter. And what we start viewing now is that when we make the solution 10 times more diluted, but we have more of it. So we have the moles of the hydrochloric acid stay the same. So we have 10 times lower concentration of hydrochloric acid, so 0 0.001 moles per liter, but we have a full liter of that. So what do you think? Think for a second. Think for three seconds. What do you think? What happens with the titration curve? Okay, because previously we said that the base, base part of this titration curve, so before the stoichiometric point, depends on the concentration of the acid. So therefore, we, assu we can assume that this uh, part of the titration curve will change. Of course, the pH in the stoichiometric point should not change because still the sodium hydroxide and uh, hydrochloric acid have fully reacted. The solution should be neutral. Uh, and an interesting question, would the pH of the solution after the stoichiometric point change or not? And interestingly, it does, because here we have the sodium hydroxide concentration. And if we take more of the starting solution, then uh, we, of course, uh, dilute the solution, the sample solution after the stoichiometric point more, and this will also change. So visually, when we now di take, uh, dilute the sample 10 times, but also take more of it so that the moles stay the same, we'll see a titration curve change so that it the titration curves jump, as we call it here, and next to the stoichiometric uh, point is 
becoming less high. So both the pH of the region of the solution before the accrual uh, of the stoichiometric point becomes higher, as well as the pH of the solution after the stoichiometric points becomes lower. And this is simply a dilution effect. We essentially just dilute the solutions, both of them. And when we do that even 10 times more, then the jump becomes even less. And uh, if we dilute it very much, then we see that there almost isn't really a nice jump. The curve is very flat. And this is actually a, uh, the reason why we can't titrate very, very low concentration solutions because the titration jump is very, very uh, small and we can't very well differentiate between the, uh, between the pH before and after the stoichiometric point. So, however, we can also have a vice versa example. We can also titrate the base with an acid. And in these cases, the titration curve looks reversed. So we start with the situation where we have only the strong base in the solution here when zero milliliters of, uh, of hydrochloric acid have, has been added. So then the pH is very high. And when we add hydrochloric acid, then part of the sodium hydroxide reacts with it. Sodium hydroxide concentration is decreasing and we get a slight, slight decrease until very close to the stoichiometric point. And, and in the stoichiometric point, pH then drops dramatic, dramatically and we get a, a, a jump in our titration curve in the equivalent point. Uh, in the stoichiometric point, the pH improves 7. And after this, the hydrochloric acid, if we add more of that uh, is determining the pH of the solution. So the strong base titration with strong acid looks very similar, but it's the, the curve is just reversed. But we can also uh, titrate weak acids or weak bases with the, uh, the, the uh, opposite solution. And let's see what happens with different weak acids. And let's, let's look on the example of an, acidi an acetic acid, which has a pKa of 4.75. The sodium hydroxide solution that we use for the titration is still the same sodium hydroxide with 0.1 mol per liter concentration. Um, and we have the same 100 milliliters and 0.01 moles per liter of acetic acid as we had before for hydrochloric acid in the very first example. So before we start titrating, so in the mo at the moment when we have added zero mol milliliters of sodium hydroxide, the pH of the solution is not just the minus logarithmic concentration of acetic acid. And this is because uh, acetic acid is a weak acid and it does not dissociate fully. So therefore, in this calculation, we also have to take into account the um, dissociation constant of the acetic acid. So therefore, the pH already before starting the titration is higher than it was for the same concentration, same volume, hydrochloric acid. Now, when we start adding sodium hydroxide, uh, the part of the acetic acid is reacting with the sodium hydroxide, and we can call, start using something which is called a buffer, solu a buffer equation or also a Hendrickson-Hasselbach's Hendrickson equation, where the pH of the solution is proportional to the pKa of the solution minus logarithm of the ratio of the remaining acid uh, divided by the concentration of the sodium hydroxide that has been added to this uh, solution. And there is one specifically important point in this titration curve also already before the stoichiometric point, and this is the half neutralization point. So this is where half of the 
uh, sodium hydroxide moles have been added that are rec from the full sodium hydroxide that is required to completely react with uh, acetic acid. So if we require 10 milliliters of sodium hydroxide to react fully with our 100 milliliters 0.01 molar um, acetic acid, then this half neutralization point happens at 5 milliliters. And this is very important because here calculating the pH of the solution is very simple. In this case, the remaining acid moles is equal to the added sodium hydroxide moles and therefore the pH equals the pKa of the solution. So if you ever need to really fast sketch how would the titration curve look like, uh, then this is a very important point that kind of determines at what pH is this first part of the titration curve located. Um, then another important change in the calculations compared to the strong acid, uh, strong base um, titration reactions is that the pH at the stoichiometric point is not seven because now in the reactions we are producing acetic uh, acetate ions and these acetate ions hydrolyze in the water cycle. So, so this means that uh, the pH of the solution at the stoichiometric point will be higher than seven. So it will be 8.2 for this specific case. And in case of um, adding even more sodium hydroxide than the equivalent point, then the pH can be calculated in a, a usual way. Uh, therefore, in case of this weak acid titration compared to strong acid titration, important changes take place here at the lower part of the titration curve where the acid has not fully reacted with the uh, titrant as well as the, the change occurs in the stoichiometric point. So all in all, for weaker acids, the bottom part of the titration curve is higher, which means that the jump in this titration curve is lower than it is for stronger acids. And just to visualize what then is the effect of the pKa. So if we compare two acids with the same concentration, same volume, hydrated with the same sodium hydroxide, but they are of a different strength, then uh, the acetic acid is here visualized with a darker red line, which had a pKa of 4.7, and also the pH at the uh, half neutralization point is equal to 4.7, while for a even weaker acid with a pK of 6.0, so this is an acid that dissociates even less in the solution, the titration curve is uh, at much higher pHs, and also the half neutralization point here is at the pH of 6. And we see that the effect here is that the jump of this titration curve is much uh, shallower. So the difference in the pH before and after the stoichiometric points is narrower. And this brings us uh, problems when we want to titrate very weak acids because simply the change is very small and it's very, very hard to find indicators or other means to um, determine then the, uh, the stoichiometric point and really say that now the stoichiometric point happened, now we have a jump in the titration curve. Also, we can uh, titrate weak bases with strong acids. So, for example, one good example is ammonia titration. As I as told before, this is, for example, what is used to determine the total um, protein concentration in some foodstuff, where proteins are first converted to ammonia and then ammonia uh, can be determined. But now to actually 
find out where the stoichiometric point is, we need some kind of an indication that now the jump in the titration curve occurred when we are doing the titration. And the usual mean of doing that is by, uh, by indicators. So indicators are visual um, ways of expressing where exactly the stoichiometric point occurred, so at which uh, concentration, at which volume of the titrate. And uh, indicators themselves are also acids or bases. And the idea of indicators is that when the pH of the solution is changing, they also kind of react uh, in this titrate, in this um, change of the pH. So when the pH changes from one value to another, then in one point with specific pH, they change their form. So they go from neutral form to an anionic form or from a neutral form to a protonated form, depends on exactly which compound and which pH changes we are viewing. And these forms have different colors. Uh, so the range where they do change their color depends on their own acid base properties. So um, actually their own pKa's because they are the sem themselves acids or bases. So the color change will occur about plus minus one pH unit uh, above to below um, above to below of their own pKa values. And let's view on the example of two common indicators, methyl orange and phenol phthalate, phthalate how this actually happens. So phenol phthalate is a very common type uh, react an indicator for acid base reactions and it is widely used in the titration of strong acids with strong bases. And the reason is that uh, phenolphthalein is colorless in the pH of less than 8 and it thereafter becomes fuchsia pink uh, color. So it is a very good clear uh, color change and it, it occurs roughly at a pH of Eight, and we'll exactly see um, why this eight is important for acid titration with bases. While the methyl orange is a um, base, if the uh, pH of the solution is very acidic, then it's primarily in the protonated form, and this nitrogen here in the middle is protonated, and this form is dark red, while if the solution becomes less and less acidic, this no, nitrogen diso this um, uh, molecule dissociates and the nitrogen becomes in neutral form, the compound is neutral, and this neutral form is yellow. So with methyl orange, the color chain is from red to yellow. And uh, let's see a bit how to choose between the indicators based on the titration curves. So we have here this example of titrating of hydrochloric acid uh, with uh, sodium hydroxide that we revisited before. And um, it look, the titration curve looked like this. And my question to you now is, what do you think? Which one would be better to use? Either we should use phenolphthalein or we should use methyl orange. So I've put it the, the ranges where these co compounds do change uh, their color. These indicators change their color here with the boxes. So methyl orange was red all the way below three and yellow all the way uh, above four or, or a bit above. And between this three and four, it is changing color, while phenolphthalein is uh, 
is uh, transparent in pH is less than eight and above eight, it starts turning uh, fuchsia pinkish. So what do you think? For this titration of hydrochloric acid, should we choose phenolphthalein or should we choose methyl orange as an indicator? Okay, uh, I hope you reached a decision that methyl orange might not be the best choice because when we look at this box that uh, indicates where methyl orange can change color, then we see that it can start happening already somewhere here at pH 3. And this is actually occurring for this titration around 8 milliliters of added sodium hydroxide. So way before the actual stoichiometry point occurs. So if we would choose this indicator, we would actually get an underestimated hydrochloric acid concentration because the color of the solution started churning much before the psychometric point. However, for phenolphthalein, we see that the uh, color change would occur immediately after the psychometric point. There's very, very few uh, drops, maybe one drop, maybe even half of a drop after the psychometry point took place, the color would rapidly change. So therefore, in this example, the phenolphthalein, of course, would be a better choice as an indicator. Uh, but let's look also what happens if we dilute the solution. So we had the case where we diluted the solution 100 uh, times and uh, the titration curve jump became just much, much narrower. And now the question is uh, still the same. Is it which indicator to choose? Okay, so methyl orange would actually not uh, change any color at all in this case, because oh, even at the starting point of the titration, the pH would be four and methyl orange would be completely yellow. It would not even change a color at all. It would always be yellow. So we couldn't find out any information. In case of phenolphthalein, the phenolphthalein would start changing the color indeed after, slightly after the um, stoichiometry point of this titration. But the problem is that here, the jump of this uh, titration curve is not anymore so high. So that means that we might end up over titrating the solution because it turns fully fuchsia pink only 10.5 milliliters uh, of added sodium hydroxide. So significantly more than actually is the correct stoichiometric point. So this uh, means two things. Firstly, that um, the same um, indicator might not work for the same compound depending on the concentration, but actually even more it means that very uh, diluted solutions are extremely hard to titrate because of this very um, narrow jumps on the titration curve and therefore we can titrate, use titration to determine more concentrated solutions and not so and not so diluted solutions. Another important question is the choice of the indicator for weak acids. So these are these two acids with pKa of 4.7, acetic acid and the pKa of 6.0, which is even slightly weaker acid than acetic acid. And here we see again, that if we would choose methyl orange, then it would change color for acetic acid uh, almost immediately within first two milliliters, which is not suitable. And for the even weaker acid, we wouldn't see any change in the uh, color. So methyl orange is out from this comparison. Then octalane very nicely fits also acetic acid because it starts changing color 
uh, just a tiny bit before the real stoichiometric point or, or even at the stoichiometric point. It is a bit more problematic with the even weaker acid because here phenolphthalein starts changing color a, a bit more before the actual stoichiometric point, so around like 9.2 milliliters or something like this. So it would mean that we under titrate uh, our solution. So we say that the um, consumed sodium hydroxide is much less than is actually needed to reach the stoichiometric point. And this facilitates that uh, the very weak acids can't be titrated very well because the uh, titration curves jump becomes too small and it's very hard to find a suitable um, indicator to actually visualize this jump. So in these cases, there are two possibilities, either to use a different kind of a, of a measure to actually uh, determine the stoichiometric point or to use different media where so different uh, so solvent where these acids are stronger and can be better titrated. So these usually are some organic solvents where we could titrate also slightly weaker acids. And uh, now let's visit also how to, uh, how does the indicator selection work for strong bases? So let's look at the titration of uh, sodium hydroxide um, with the So lastly, let's see how does the indicator choice depend on when we are titrating a strong base with a strong acid. And let's look at the example of titration of sodium hydroxide with hydrochloric acid. So here we had the case where we had a very basic solution before. The solution became less and less basic, while uh, close to stoichiometric point, the pH dropped very sharply and we had a nice high titration curve jump. Uh, so now my question to you would be how to choose between phenolphthalein and methyl orange in this titration case. Bogulio came up with an answer that phenolphthalein is not so good while methyl orange seems to work. So why does phenolphthalein not work is that the charge starts changing its color somewhere around uh, pH okay so let's now look what happens with the indicator selection in case of strong base titration um, so we have this example of sodium hydroxide titration with hydrochloric acid the pH in this titration starts decreasing slightly with added hydrochloric acid concentration until it drops very sharply um, close to the stoichiometric point. And let's now see what happens with the phenolphthalein and methyl orange in case of this titration. So what did you think? What, what, which one of these uh, indicators would be a suitable one? Actually, either one you pick could work in this specific example. Uh, meaning that both the phenylphthalein and methyl orange change their color at the, uh, at the very sharp titration um, curve part, so at the jump of the titration curve, and therefore both of them would work. However, what is important to mention is that if you would have slightly uh, more diluted sodium hydroxide solution, phenylphthalein could become uh, unsuitable because the part of the titration curve here, when we have mostly sodium hydroxide still in the solution, we come, would become lower and lower. And in one point, we would face a, a case where phenolphthalein would not anymore uh, change color in this uh, 
uh, in this uh, titration curve jump part, but already when you have majority of the analytes, they not titrated. Uh, another important thing to, to mention is that uh, it is also very important to find the titration indicator, which has a very nice uh, color change. So phenolphthalein, for example, is legendariously good because the color change from colorless to um, um, pink is, is very, very good. But some of them are not so easy to visualize, and some of them really need uh, practicing to to get a kind of a memory, how does the color before and after stoichiometric point have to look like? Uh, so therefore, there are actually tons of different uh, different indicators, which also fit slightly different situations. So depending on where the stoichiometric point exactly should be located, as well as different media. So we here considered only titration in the water phase. But if we would be doing our titration in some organic solvents, then we would also look at different set of indicators. And considering the range of the color change for all different indicators is one of the uh, very important aspects as well in choosing the titration re-indicator. Uh, lastly, what I would like to stress here is that uh, it is not good to add too much type uh, indicator to the titration uh, vessel because the, the indicators themselves are also acids and bases. So they would start um, reacting with our titrant as well and we would get all, uh, an overestimated results if we add too much of the um, indicator. So we should add the indicator so that uh, we can visualize the color change but not more than that. So this was about titration for the acid-base titration, and we'll continue with the potentiometric uh, titration in the next video.